10. Thank you. So a machine being up for four minutes and already transferred four gigabytes of traffic. What could that be? Something screwed the network stack? Something strange with that machine? If you are on this machine, and it perhaps is not your own machine, you really, really could, should get suspicious at this point. That might be a honeypot. We show you how you find out and what to do about that. So, who of you knows what a honeypot is? Just for, okay. So nearly everybody knows what a honeypot is, so I can do a very quick introduction. Um, on this page, you see uh, the typical setup of a generation two honeypot. A honeypot is, according to the definition by the Honeynet org people, a concept to use uh, to monitor the tool, tactics, and motives of the placard community. So basically, they want to see what you do w once you rooted one of the boxes, what tools you use, what commands you use, where do you connect, and what are your actions. And um, as you can see, in the orange box, there were Honeynet typically consists of two main components. In the upper part, you see the wall. That's a transparent bridge. That means it has no IP address. It doesn't decrement the TTL of a, a bypassing packet. And basically, you only do data capture and data, data control on this device. Data capture means that you run TCP dump on this box. So you can log every packet, what's going inside and outside of your network. You also collect all data that your honeypots are producing on this box. Uh, on the other hand, the honeywall does data control. That means you, con you install Snort Inline, an intrusion prevention system on the system. Snort Inline is a modification of Snort. So basically what it does, it filters all the uh, outgoing traffic. It searches for exploits and can block them or they can modify them so that you, as you've owned one of these boxes, can't do any harm to an, um, an outgoing box. It's mainly used for um, legal actions so that you don't have to feel that someone who roots, who roots one of those honeypots can do some damage to another side. Um, the other data control that's done by the honeywall is something like uh, a traffic limitation. So for example, um, they do traffic shaping so, so that you've got only perhaps 10 kilobytes per second of output, or they do some kind of traffic restriction, basically uh, only 25 TCP connections per day, for example. So um, apart from the honey wall, on the uh, downside you see the honey pots. The honey pots are the main interesting part of the honey pot, uh, of the main honey net. Um, a honeypot is basically a tool that should be probed, attacked, or compromised. So you just install a normal system, for example, a, li a Linux box, a Windows box, a Solaris, a BSD, whatever comes to mind. You do not very much change things on this box. Basically, you just add some logging capabilities, and then you install normal services. You connect those honeypots through the honeywall to the internet, and then you just watch what happens. In order to learn the tool texts and motives of the packet community, you have to um, do something so that you can watch their actions. For example, the TCP dump is completely useless if the intruder uses something like an SSH connection. You only see then the encrypted traffic, and without the appropriate key, you can't decrypt anything. So basically, you have to do other, meaning, uh, other things to watch the attackers who, are, who, uh, who own your honeypots. The main tool used nowadays is CVEC. Oops. CVEC has the capabilities to monitor all, act all activities on the uh, honeypot. So or basically, it claims that it can um, lock everything. We'll show later in this talk that this claim isn't true. With the help of CVEC, you are um, the operator of a honeypot is able to control everything that you do on one of those boxes. If you do an SSH connection to the honeypot, he'll see everything you type. If you do something like a secure copy, he will notice everything. If you um, decrypt your, bi uh, your burn-eye protected binary, he'll notice the password and can 
also decrypt your burn eye encrypted binary. How does he do it? Um, basically, um, ZBEC is a kernel module. There are variants of ZBEC for Linux. It's the main, or like the current implementation, only for 2.4 kernels. Then there's also an impl implementation for OpenBSD. For Windows, it's only a rudimentary implementation. We've got also for Solaris or some other operating systems implementations of ZBEC. In this talk, we'll mainly cover ZBEC for Linux because Linux is the main honeypot used nowadays. So, how does ZBEC work? In the first version, ZBEC was based on a door. A door is perhaps everyone here knows what a door is. It's one of the most known rootkits nowadays. In the current version, version 2.1.7, it's all, everything is re-implemented and ZBEC is a complete new um, new system. What it basically does is hijacks the system called the suite. So every time one of your programs or any program calls read, then um, ZBEC does the following. It passes the um, data to the original system call. The result is copied into another buffer. To the buffer is added something like a ZBEC header. Then everything is copied into an SK buffer structure. The structure is copied or handled to the um, driver, and the driver sends everything to the outside. The sending is done in a covered way. Um, because you use the SK buffer structure, the, all the PK-based um, firewall rules won't notice that there anything is going wrong. So if ZBEC is uh, running on the box and you fire up TCP dump, none of these ZBEC packets will you notice one of them. It uh, basically modifies proc net def in order to hide its presence. It fiddles with the counters, and so you can't see that uh, ZBEC is sending anything to another box. Um, the packages that are hidden are identified by a magic number. That's a 30-bit value. They are identified by being used by being in a UDP packet and a special um, yeah, port number for UDP, basically. In order to hide ZDEC or the, pr the presence of ZDEC on the host, there are some things that are currently done. For example, ZDEC loads as a kernel module, and it's in the basic installation, it's, it has just got one random name consisting only of um, some numerical values. After once a second module is loaded, it's cleaner.o, um, that's also part of the Adore rootkit. Uh, Cleaner.o has basically only one function. It unlinks the next module in the module structure list and then unloads itself. So basically, after Cleaner.o is loaded, ZDEC is unloaded from the module list and so um, something like LSMod won't see that there's any other package showing up. So now we are going to demonstrate our toolkit to give you a first impression on what we did and then after step by step we will install and we, we will show you how everything works. So we, we have the honeypot run by an evil entity. In this case Thorsten is running it on his notebook. Um, we have the logging server went by an evil entity too, which in this case I'm on my notebook. And we have the attacker's machine, which is run by a good hero, in this case me, my notebook. Um, I'm now logged in on the honeypot, and for demonstration purposes, I'll start a web server there, which is badly vulnerable. So this web server, um, basically, um, you can upload a binary and it executes it um, if you use the secret post parameter exploit. Um, this is a simple vulnerability. You could go for more difficult ones, but for the demonstration purposes, we have this very vulnerable web server. So now I work on my own machine. First, 
because this machine has to act as a oh, logging server. I have the window getting the logging packets sent by the honeypot. This is this one. Um, Thorsten will now type something on the honeypot. And as you can see, we have basically keystroke logging here. Okay, now I'll start an attack on the honeypot by uploading a binary to the vulnerable server. This binary is built on demand and basically um, contains our attack tool, which was uploaded by a, via curl to the server now. And now we are connected already to our attack server. As you might have seen, there um, did some logging taking place because um, the uploaded tool was basically a SHA archive extracting itself and executing the attack server, which is written in Python. Um, basically, if you're willing to code C or do something else dirty, you can get around that. I'm now connected with a server with our attack server called Kebas and can execute arbitrary commands, for example, listing the root directory of the honeypot. And as you see in the lower window, there's no further logging taking place. I can get information on the machine. You might notice that now I'm still running with the UID of the web server, nobody, 65534. I can read files on the server as long as nobody can read them, for example, etc passwd, without any logging still taking place. I can upload files and I can execute files without any further logging. In this case, I will execute a vulnerable SUID script replaced on the server for demonstration purposes. And then again, we get a, get a little bit logging because this again is written in Python and we are too lazy to convert it to C. And now, a wonder, we used the vulnerable SUID already to execute a second cable server, now running as root. I'll demonstrate by connecting with a second client to the server, now running on a different part. And I, again, can execute all kinds of commands there without further logging. You might notice that now the effective user ID is zero, so this KBAS server is running as root. We can read files now only readable by root, like shadow, it is a shadow, without any logging. And we can send special commands like the nosebreak command, with thus some logging, but basically we are get warning messages because Kibes, uh, because the ZBEC toolkit is completely out of his mind and gets too much data and can't log anything. And now we have the nice information of a cleanup routine, and we can jump there with a tool we uploaded before. And now we get some warnings because the GNU people are bigots, um, and there is no honeypot anymore. As you can see, I'm now again on the honeypot and there's no logging taking place, no keystroke logging. And if Thorsten works on the honeypot, no keystroke logging still. We have removed the Zebec toolkit from the kernel with nearly no logging data. Okay, so much for the teaser. Now for the background. Who are we and why do we do that? We are both from uh, the Laboratory for Dependable Distributed Systems at Aachen University, where Thorsten is a research student and I'm a research assistant. And this laboratory is running a honey net. And we wanted to see if this is really a good thing and um, if we can trust the data on there and for the heck of it, if we can bring it down. Um, the authors of Zebeck, um, just for information, this is not a picture of the author of Zebek, which is a really nice guy and a smart one too, but that's Zebek himself, at least at the ancient Egyptians saw them, because it's an ancient Egyptian name, um, claiming that even if Zebek is 
being disabled, um, one would be able to lock how it is being disabled. And we had uh, our issues with this assumption and tried if we can attack it, and we were able to. Yeah. I, I think we did this demo already with the vulnerable server. So now we come to detecting Zebek. So if you, as you've seen in our demonstration, we are basically able to detect the presence of Zebek on the hosts. We can um, avoid the complete logging and we are also able to disable Zebek once we are root on a box. So basically we are able to compromise a honeypot to, uh, completely. We will now give a step-by-step -step introduction to how we did it, and at first we want to talk at um, several ways to detect Zebek. If you think about Zebek, Zebek is basically a rootkit, so um, our uh, results can also be extended to some kind of to for rootkit detection. If you think about this whole task, then there has come several minds and uh, several way several ways into mind. At first, as I saw, uh, as I explained, there's the honey wall. The honey wall is running in front of the complete honey net, and um, it does some kind of data logging and data restriction. So basically, you could find some ways to detect the honey wall. And if you detect the honey wall, then this is a strong sign that there's also a host which is Zebek running. Um, detecting the honey wall is left as an exercise for you. If you need some information on this, just look at one of the, or the two fake frag issues. Um, I think four or five months ago, uh, there are some hints. So it's basically just a few tall scripts that you have to write. Um, as I said before, um, the logging takes place by putting all data that's logged by the suite into a buffer and then sending this to over the, the line to the logging hosts. So basically, if we do uh, much, log, uh, much reading, then we should be able to fill up the complete line and see some latency effects. Also, Zebek has to fiddle with the network counters because it, um, it communicates directly with the driver. You have to uh, adjust the drivers so that the output of ifconfig and any other tools is consistent with the system. So if we take a closer look at the network traffic counters, we will also probably find some signs of Zebek. Um, uh, very obvious way is the modification of the syscall table. Basically, there are some pointers which are changed, and perhaps we can uh, detect it. With the help of cleaner.o, Zebek also unloads itself and, and tries to hide itself. So we should be able to find a hidden module in memory and perhaps we can do other, some other things in memory in order to detect Zebek. I go now step to step on these five points and explain what we've did. At first we take a look at the latency. Perhaps you all know the dd command. It's a very easy tool and with the help of this command we can um, within perhaps 10 seconds detect that um, Zebek is running on a host and we'll just show you this. Um, the command is something like dd. Uh, as input file, we take dev0 and output file dev null. So basically, we copy, we copy just in, inside the system some uh, from dev0 to dev null with a block size of 1. And then we should see some effects. So basically, Maximilian will now on this demonstration. So we, we booted the HoneyNet because we just removed the HoneyPod software for demonstration. We installed the HoneyNet and we started SSHD. Oh, we are doing that now. Um, uh, basically, I shut it down SSH for purposes. So we are on DEFCON network and probably it's not secure. So. Yeah. Okay, um, now Civic is running on the host. Um, and at first, you should ping. So at first, we just do a ping from this machine to this machine. We got uh, connected through a um, yeah, direct connection, just a cross cable. And as you see, we've got a latency of about 0 0.3 milliseconds. So now we start DD in the background. 
and do this kind of ping again. As you see on the output, there's some latency. We, are, we can't type anything. Uh, it should take a few seconds. And as you see, the, oh, the reply times go about uh, a factor of 10 or something like this. We've got more than two milliseconds now. So we've got a latency effect. Um, and yeah, basically, in a, within 10 seconds, we were able to detect that the, 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 there's something going on. So um, as the next step to detect the presence of Zebek as another approach, we take a look at the network traffic counters. As I said before, Zebek yeah, just fiddles with PROC net dev. Um, it basically changes the output of the TX, bar P, uh, TX packets inside PROC net dev. And then if we compare this output to the output of ifconfig, then we should see also some differences. For the purpose of this, we wrote some uh, kernel module. The kernel module is basically um, a modification of Zebek. Um, I just removed a lot of lines and basically changed only two lines. And now, as you can see, at the TX bytes counter, we've got, I don't know if, no, no laser pointer. So we've got about um, 20.6 kilobyte. Um, do yeah, we are connected to the box via an SSH connection, so basically we have about two kilobytes or so per second on uh, additional TX bytes output. Now we um, insert into the kernel this dev checker. Dev checker basically changes the output of PROCnet dev back to its original values. And if we now uh, start so something like the DD command in the background with we see that we've basically now 70.4 megabytes. Um, and if we've got now, we've got 22. So within a few seconds, we've got more than five megabytes on data. If we now unload the module, also, oh, well, we see this, these latency effects again because um, DD is running in the background. So if we now uh, emot the, um, the module from the kernel, then we should see that the, back, the, the, the network counter goes back again. So I think the latency now went up to infinity. Um, and now it works. And you see the um, transmit counter is now 22 megabytes. And if we unload our module, module it went back down to 42 uh, kilobytes. So there's something fish, fishy with the transmit counter, obviously. OK, and the third approach to detect the presence of Zebek is based on the syscall table. As you already perhaps know, um, the syscall table is, is just a uh, yeah, a table with every syscall, and each syscall uh, points to somewhere in the memory. It's something like a function pointer, nothing more. As you see on the left side, we've got sysexit, sysread, sysright, sysopen. So sysright is the one that's hijacked via um, Zebek. If Zebek loads now into memory, we are depicted as this mod dot one two three four five dot o. It just um, changes the the pointer from the this read to the uh, to the other module, and so we should see that the pointers from the this read, this write, and this open are not um, in the neighborhood. We just wrote in um, yeah a small kernel module. Before the loading of Zebek, the counters of this read, uh, the memory locations of the this read and this write were very um, very close together. And after reading, you see um, that this. Oh, I think that's that's wrong. This sh the upper part should be this right, the other is this read. That that's now in another memory location, and so that there's something fishy is going on. So, so Zebek currently is implemented as a loadable module um, because seemingly a setting up a honeypot has to be idiot proof. Um, and patching your kernel isn't acceptable. Um, 
a kernel module probably we can find it even if it's hidden and if we can find it we can start to extract the variables inside the kernel module and probably we might be even able to disable it every module in Linux starts with a module header which is defined to include Linux module age um, and this module header starts with a struct uh, with the size of the struct of the module header which is 96 in current Linux implementations with pointers to the name of the module and to the next module so these are two pointers into kernel space and the one even has to point to another valid module structure and the name pointer has to point to some ASCII string and some other point pointers further down which should point into kernel space too then function pointers to the startup function and the shutdown function of the module which should point into the module space and some integers which have uh, only a very small reasonable um, space of values of usually one, two or three and with all these values um, we can probably fingerprint memory locations which look like a module header that's not that hard because a module header and the whole module is allocated by the kernel's vmalloc function and th this function aligns all memory allocated via to page boundaries so every 4k um, is the only position where a module header can start this means we only have to check every fourth uh, yeah, uh, every 4k or every pa page um, for a module header and vmalloc only starts allocating malloc at vmalloc start with this a kernel constant and go only reserves memory for vmalloc reserved bytes so a lit, very simple loop about 128 bytes of uh, megabytes of kernel memory in 4k steps helps us to check out the possible locations of a module header and we'll now shortly demonstrate that Thorsten now says we don't. Um, yeah, but at least I can show you um, the LS mod uh, outputs uh, five modules. And but if we start Module Hunter, which was published in a recent FRAC article, um, we see another module, which is SNT PCMCIA, which is our kernel module in this case. So if we are able to find this module with other techniques in module hunter we should be able to extract the variables um, Zebek is very sophisticated or at least a little bit sophisticated in hiding its modules uh, its variables whenever Zebek is com recompiled um, this Perl program or the fragment of a Perl program changes the location of the variables used by Zebek in a block of allocated memory basically Zebek has a huge block zeroed out it's about between 512 bytes and I think 1k it's random the size of this block and the variables used by Zebek are at randomly placed in this block at every compilation so but if, if we start looking into this block we can use heuristics to decide or to at least guess do an educated guess which might which value might be which va um, variable for example this might be an IP address but if it would be an IP address it is a multicast address which is quite unlikely that a multicast address is the address of the logging server so perhaps it's the magic value used by Zebek to hide its packages and uh, full code might be a magic value um, another number like this this is a valued IP address so it might be the address of the Zebek logging, logging server this might be a port number the port number using for the logging server and these short values might be parts of a MAC address just a byte sized which looks very much like a MAC address so 
by searching for the kernel module and then using the heuristics, we can get quite good results in guessing if Zebek is there and what are the kernel, uh, the variable values. So we have written a Python tool which passes the kernel structures at runtime. Um, the most difficult part is um, finding the syscall table because the Linux people have remo removed in their wisdom the kernel symbol for the system call table because nobody needs the address of the system call table um, and we locate them by looking for other kernel symbols and from there tracing the address of the system call table. Um, then here the system call table is finally uh, found. Uh, this message has a typo. It's not this white which is probably hijacked but this read which is hijacked which we showed, um, or Thorsten showed you when the values are far apart, there's something probably wrong. And then the, our heuristics guessing that there is a module which should be Zebek named sound PCMCIA. And we guess. At Mac fragments, for example, probably all these ones are not Mac fragments. But I assure you that um, 3D, 3F, 5E, and I think 7B, some of them <laughs> are fragments of the MAC address of this computer acting as a uh, no, that computer of the Honeywell, the sender's MAC address. And this FF, 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 FF is actually the MAC address we use for sending out the Zebek logging data. So while we can't get the exact variables of the Zebek kernel module, we can reduce the space you have to try to very small one. Um, and we have a lot of possible port addresses. And in fact, we used 1111 as a source port address and 2222 as a destination port address. Um, in most instances, we get a lot less variables, um, a le lot less possible guesses, but you know there's a d demonstration effect of Murphy's Law. If you do a demonstration, the heuristics will draw a bad day. Um, the possible IP addresses, there again in this list of about two dozen addresses, this is the address of our logging server, and after that is the address of the honeypot. So we already uh, again guessed the right IP address. Um, and the magic value we actually used is in this list of possible magic value. At least it should be there. Yeah, there are dead beef. Okay. Oh, messed that up. So, how to disable Zebek? Um, there's a very nice and easy way. The authors of Zebek thought, oh, it should be disabled, and so they placed, being good designers of kernel modules, a nice little cleanup function in there which does everything. Um, we would need it de-hijacks the, the read pointer, cleans nicely up everything, and exits the module. And if we are able to get the address of the cleanup function, we just call that cleanup function, and Zebek cleans up after itself, and it is away. Um, and as you might remember, that we were able to locate the module header, and the module header has a pointer to the cleanup function. So basically getting rid of Zebek is more or less trivial. Um, find the module header, get the address of the cleanup function, jump in the cleanup function. That was a kernel jumper module we uploaded in our demonstration, which just does nothing more than jump to an address in the kernel. And you are all set and done. Um, the obvious way, if you don't think about the cleanup function, is reconstruct this read pointer and let it point again back to the original kernel function for doing so. But the tricky part is getting the address of the original kernel function. There are ways to reconstruct that from, from the kernel binary itself, but they are tricky. Or you could find, um, it, you can poke into the Zebek module itself because it still has a pointer to the original read function. But why do that if you can clean up? If you are really crazy, or if somebody decided to use Zebek not as a kernel module, but to compile it into the kernel, you, always, you just look to the 
actual this read function, which is in there, probably torrent by Zebeck, and overwrite it at one time with a clean read function. That's not that trivial because you have to get all the pointers and the jumps right leading from the, your new read function, which is untainted, to the rest of the kernel, but it should be possible. So after we've seen some ways to detect Zebeck, and now we um, take a look at how to avoid logging at all. So basically, we um, have to we have some problems. Um, there are some data that the operator of the Honey port is always logging. For example, the network traffic. We um, we have to connect remote to the Honey port because it's not under our um, physical control. So we have to use some kind of network. And all network traffic has to flow through the honey wall, so basically the operator can catch uh, all traffic there. So we can't do anything against this. Also, Zebek is loaded on the box, so before we can unload it, um, the operator will see all calls to read. Everything we've done via read, uh, via read, he is able to log, and he can analyze this later. And there are some other data that uh, that, the that the operator can obtain. For example, if we um, use some of our tools and then uh, write them on disk, then the operator can, after he has seen that we've compromised this box, then he can do uh, some kind of forensic and reconstruct all data that we left on the disk. So basically, we want to find a way that we can, in a limit, um, in a yeah, as far as we uh, as far as we want uh, to keep everything in memory and not write anything to disk at all. There are some syslog data that we can't control because the services per are perhaps um, logging something, and the operator will also get these values and he can analyze them. So, what can we do against logging? For logging of the network traffic, there's an obvious way: we simply use encryption whenever possible. Um, because when there's encrypted network traffic, the operator can lock everything, but without the appropriate key, he can't de decrypt anything. So we have to encrypt everything, and the only problem with this approach is how to deliver our initial exploit. At the initial exploit, if we don't use any kind of connection, uh, any, any kind of encryption, then the operator will see this exploit, and we've got, uh, we lost our zero day, so perhaps we use, use should use something like an HTTPS connection or POP3S or something secure so that this connection is also encrypted and the operator can't see anything. For this purpose, we used in our demonstration um, an HTTPS server, so basically no one can see something with the help of TCP dump or similar tools. Another possible way to disable uh, the logging of network traffic would be if we could compromise the honey wall. If we have got root on the, camp, uh, on the honey wall, we could erase everything, all logging data, but usually the honey wall is extremely secured, um, often with gear security and similar patches, and it has no IP address, so it's basically a hard task to find it and to get root on this box. So probably uh, you have to find other ways. With, um, and then, with the help of Zebek, the operator can see everything what we do via read. Um, so what programs do we use read? Nearly every program that uses some kind of interaction. Um, most programs you see use read to, um, to read some kind of um, configuration files or user input, so we have to avoid read at all. A nice example for avoiding read would be network programs. Network programs use receive to, uh, to read from a socket. So basically, we, if we can use receive instead of read, there's some way to avoid everything. Um, the problem is, why is any, every program using read? And why doesn't encryption help? If you have a connection from the internet to your SSH daemon, Sure, the SSH daemon is reading from a socket, but the whole communication from the internet is encrypted, and so is the communication over the socket. It's de decrypted inside the SSH daemon. So even if um, SSH is reading from the socket, that shouldn't help um, the operator of the HoneyNet because it's just uh, he's just being, seeing the encrypted data. The problem is the SSH 
D can't do anything at all. It starts all the time, external programs, even for copying files, it needs SCP. And usually it has a bash or another shell behind that. And SSH, D has to um, communicate with that shell. And that is done by using a Unix pipe. And this Unix pipe has two um, file descriptor at its end, the SSH, the end, and the bash end, and the bash is reading the keystrokes via that file descriptor, and these are unencrypted. So basically, if we could marry SSH, the end, bash into a single program and get rid of that pipe, no logging would take place. So before um, taking a look at how we can avoid the uses of reach, we just take a short look at what is actually logged by Zebeck. On the right, you can see Zebeck um, and this is an, just the structure that basically consists of the Zebeck header. There are some values that are locked, for example, the magic number, um, the version number, type number. There are some information about the count time, the PID, the UID, the, f uh, the file descriptor, and then the 12 first bytes of the pr uh, program that's calling the read, and the length of the total Zebeck packet. So the operator gets um, quite a few information about everything. For example, the PID and UID, so he knows who is just calling read and what PID and UID it has. Also, it sees the file descriptor, but perhaps we can fiddle with the file descriptor. For example, we can, mm, yeah, there are the three standard file operators, 0, 1, and 2. Perhaps we can fiddle with them, so um, just use the one for um, one for standard out or something like this, and uh, yeah, we can just play with these. And it also locks the 12 bytes of the program that's calling read. Perhaps we can also fiddle with this. For example, if we rename the binary, if we just copy to another location or something like this, if we use a, um, a name that starts with at first 12 space characters and then the real program name or something similar. So um, if we are uh, want to avoid read, the first thought is that we, are could, that we should make read unreliable. As we've seen in our demonstration, in our second demonstration, I think, if we start DD in the background, then we generate lots of packets, then we've got some kind of um, yeah, denial of service against the honey wall, it doesn't react or something like this. So basically, if we just put enough data through uh, the read system calls, we make it unreliable. As we've seen at the demonstration, there were some error uh, messages about lost packets. These were basically uh, error messages uh, made by Zebeck because Zebeck was unable to send some packets. So uh, we made the read by Zebeck unreliable. But basically, we can't control which um, which, of which information are lost. So basically, if we start DD in the background, we are, sure that we are sure that some packets are lost, but we don't know which packets are lost. So this is an unreliable approach. A better approach is that we, um, yeah, we just quit, start, um, quit using read. So we can use mmap to directly map some files into memory. We just map them into memory and can then work with them as normal. So basically, we can nearly re uh, live without read. There are some problems. For example, we can't use devices. We can't map devices in memory. We can't use Unix pipes or similar things. We are just stuck with files. But perhaps we can exploit this and avoid reading um, yeah, and avoid the read system call. It's very hard to monitor uh, mmap because with mmap, I'm able to just map two gigabytes of um, of contents into, the f um, into my memory and no one wants to transfer two gigabytes over such a small link just to log something. So, so how can I live without read? The first thing I have to say goodbye to my shell. The shell is designed to read anything from its standard in, so I can't use it. I need something, like mentioned before, which directly talks to the network, encrypted, and executes directly your commands. Um, the nice thing is that the command used in Unix to execute actually a program, exec, does not call read, at least in Linux, so it doesn't use the internal kernel read call. Um, but if you execute a program, it might import libraries, and some of those libraries are read via read, 
Um, some are mapped into the memory. I wasn't able to find out the system behind that, but probably there is a system behind that. So people might guess which program you have been started by exec by seeing the libraries being imported and if the program you are executing is reading config files by seeing the config files being read. We can mess with the process name. We just can copy, copy and rename the net binary. For example, if we rename cat to um, sudo and then cat something which looks like a sudo as file, um, probably the forensic expert looking at the log file will think we were successfully executing the sudo program. Oh, but I think sudo is executed by, by everybody, by world on usual Linux systems. On parent Linux systems, it's just executable by the real group. Um, I'm not so much into Linux, more on FreeBSD. Um, so the results. We can read files unnoticed by mapping them into memory. We can possibly execute programs unnoticed by the calling exec if they don't um, pull into any libraries we are read into memory. Since file names are not locked, there's a file descriptor locked, but not the name associated with the file descriptor. We can give the impression of reading certain files. If we have a file, create a file in TMP, which looks like a password file, and cat that, the um, forensic analyst will see something which looks like a password file and probably guess that it was just the password file and it will take him some time to find out it wasn't. And we can give the impression that we are executing programs which we can't execute because they are only executable by um, higher privileged users. So we implemented all of this into the Keybase tool, uh, which is proof of concept code. And the nifty thing about it, it's a network attack tool which is entirely written in a very high level language in Python. So it's very, very portable. You don't have to compile it for an architecture or so. As long as there's a Python interpreter on the target machine, um, it runs. Um, and if there's no Python interpreter and you are willing to move a lot of data around the network, you just can bundle the program with the Python interpreter itself and push the interpreter on the target machine like you would do with a C program where you put the C core into the target machine. Um, it can do everything you can expect from a shell, not bash, but perhaps ash or something, a basic shell, and it's very highly dynamic. It's noteworthy that um, the Grok recently published a tool which had some of the same ideas um, in the latest frag. It's, I think it's keeping your zero day safe part two or something is the name of that. And here's a tool which is able to transfer binary to a target machine and execute it there without ever writing it to disk. Basically, that's um, what Keybus is doing too, but on a very different level, because we were able to do different things with our high-level language. Um, Keybus used TCP sockets for networking, but it could use anything else, because it's modular designed. Um, for example, if you deliver your exploit and still have an open socket, um, or something like that, uh, you could use that. On top of that, um, TCP, we implement a crypto layer, the crypto layer is um, gen generating the key pair by Diffie-Hellman. Um, that's another in our case. Diffie-Hellman uh, would be fall to a man in the middle attack. But um, the honey Honeywall up to now, we, or the Honeywalls we know are only passive devices and Diffie-Hellman is safe against passive devices. And, uh, Later we used an AES for providing um, the crypto, and the crypto layer also contains compression and random length padding to make it difficult for a forensic analyst seeing the network traffic to guess at the commands we were sending by the length of them. The main problem is to, getting entropy, to get entropy for Diffie-Hellman because we can't read from diff, diff random on the honeypot. That would be locked by Zebek and the forensic analyst would be able to reconstruct our whole Diffie-Hellman key exchange if we had that random numbers. Um, we solved this problem today by using other techniques like thread races and hashing the whole content of TMP and VAR and so on. And um, 
that is no really high security crypto entropy, but it should be enough to frustrate a forensic analyst. On top of the crypto layer, we have a Python specific key base layer, which basically communicates by sending objects across the network. The key base layer can send multiple commands at once, and the commands can work on multiple objects. So, for example, you can um, send write these two dozen files, read this one file, and delete that ten files, all in one Kibas command, or in one Kibas data packet. And the asynchronous commands at the moment are not implemented, but the protocol supports them because asynchronous communication, implementing them, it's really basically a pain in the ass. Um, the ni nice thing is the Kibas server, when you inject it, on the target machine, it knows only a single command, or a single Python object you can use, add command. So is, if this server falls into the hands of a forensic analyst, he will very, learn very little. Because of Diffie-Hellman, there are no keys in the server, and there's only this very simple command, add command. And the code for all additional and interesting commands for exploiting the honeypot are pushed into the server um, at one time. The client is basically having the, at the code for the advanced commands, compiles them to Python bytecode, and pushes this bytecode objects over the line into the server, but they only exist in RAM, oh, and if you are very unlucky, they might be exist on swap space. You have to keep that in mind. Um, the, that is a very nice thing of developing a, a server, actually, because you never have to restart the server, because on every connect, when you use the client, just all the code is pushed into the server, so basically the server is reloaded. Um, the commands we have implemented are reading and writing using memory mapping, so without the this read and this write, secure deletion, so overwriting a file, truncating it to zero bytes, renaming it, and then deleting it. Um, direct execution via exec, li listing directories, getting system info. It would be nice to implement the execution without any help of the server. That would be the user land exec library, but implementing them in poor Python would be very difficult. Yeah, more information on um, the design of CBEC and Kibas can be found in an academic paper, which should be on your CD-ROM. Also on your CD-ROM should be the nosebreak program, which is able to find ZBAC in memory. The KBAS toolkit itself, when the CD-ROM was created, it was in a shape we were very afraid to give it away, um, like this code you write in the early morning hours. Um, but under this URL, you can download the KBAS toolkit and you can download videos of our demonstrations showing how we use ZBAC and Kibas and get rid of ZBAC and so on. So are there any questions? Yeah? The question was that we said that um, hijacking MMAP would be very difficult, um, but Zebek could hijack XSEC and that stuff. Yeah, you are right. Um, so we have to avoid using XSEC as much as possible. One solution would be to use userland XSEC, which is by the GRUG, and it's a library with executors without a binary without ever using. Um, this kernel's exec function. That would be very hard to hijack. The problem is that this is C code, and we basically have to push then a binary object to the um, honeypot machine, which works as long as it's the right Linux version. Actually, the um, current development version of Sebek uses also um, the suite, this um, exec, and the receive syscalls, so it monitors more syscalls. But it's not yet um, publicly released. It's in better status. OK, so no more questions. So just download it and check for honeypots.